Okay, ladies and gentlemen, section 1.8, uh, direct continuation from uh, kinetic energies of yesterday. We're going to bring it one step further and talk about potential energy, and then we're going to combine it all uh, in the middle of this. So first off, you need to understand that potential energy is energy as contained within um, the molecules themselves. It's like a battery has stored energy. Molecules also have the ability to store energy. And it comes from the fact that there's a negative cloud of electrons surrounding each molecule. And if you put two negatives together, they're going to start to repel each other. So there's a repulsive force keeping molecules away from each other. And then when they approach each other, that force is going to build and build and build. That is potential energy. So we are going to convert kinetic into potential energy back into kinetic as the molecules move close to each other and then move away from each other. The key to understand, though, that the total energy of the system is constant. So the kinetic energy plus the potential energy is going to equal the total energy. That is Einstein's thing. You cannot destroy or remove energy. You just transform it into um, different shapes. So we are going to graph how the potential energy changes over time. And that graph looks like this crazy thing right here. A um, lot of information on this one, but let's just go through it one piece at a time. First off, it all stems from the fact that you know that this is delta H, and this is an exothermic reaction. So one thing that's different is this bump in the middle. This bump is what we are going to study in this section. These reactants have to collide with energy that equals or is greater than the height of that bump. Okay? This height of this bump is called Ea, which stands for energy of activation or activation energy, and we'll write that down in a minute. If these reactants collide with energy greater or equal to the Ea, they will have a successful collision and form products. They form a little intermediate compound at the top of this thing called an activated complex. We can write it little AC with square brackets around it. I didn't invent that, so don't hate me. Uh, square brackets around AC means activated complex. It's super temporary, unstable um, mixture of reactants. We'll write that down later. If you can form the activated complex, well then the reaction will be successful and you will then form products. So, to say that in the form of energies, I'll highlight that right here for us. The reactants are starting with really high kinetic and low potential energy. It means that they're moving very, very fast, so they do not have a lot of energy stored up. As they approach each other, which is this region, if they approach each other, those negative repulsive forces get stronger and stronger and stronger, and the potential energy builds and builds and builds. Then, if they collide with enough energy to break those repulsive forces, then you'll form the activated complex and then the products. So we are going to break this down into a few different steps, analyze it in a little bit more detail, and it should all work out for you. So first off, you have to think that this hill is a barrier. This hill dictates how fast or slow reactions are going to be. The smaller the hill, the less energy required to start. The taller the hill, the greater the energy um, to start, and that will be slower. If you do not have enough energy, or if you are not moving fast enough to collide and break those repulsive forces, you will not react. You will stay as a reactant. So think of it as someone trying to run up a slide, and I have a funny story about that, which I'll tell you tomorrow. You can't run up the slide like some kid in grade four you will then slide right back down. Okay, you will not reach the top of the hill, and you will not have a successful reaction. So, details. You're going to want to pause it and write this down. Activation energy is that hill. The activation energy is the minimum energy required for successful collision. It's the minimum energy required to form the activated complex. An activated complex, by definition, which you will need to know, is a short-lived, unstable combination of reactants. Okay, That is the all-encompassing definition of 
activation energy and you will be tested on it, guaranteed. So, what is the EA? How is that determined? Well, it's determined by the nature of reactants. If that reactant has a very strong bond, it's going to take a lot of energy to break it. So the EA will be high. Strong bond equals high EA equals slow reaction. And the opposite is also true. If you have weak bonds, they're easy to break, the EA is low, and the reaction is fast. So you will be able to calculate EA, keeping in mind that the nature of reactants um, is not determined by anything but that molecule. So if you change the concentration or the temperature or the volume or the pressure, the type of bond in that reactant will not be affected. So the EA is not affected by temperature or concentration. That will be a quiz question. So let's put some numbers to this. Here's a graph. It's exothermic. Here is delta H from 50 down to 10 equals negative 40 kilojoules. This is exothermic. The EA starts right here at the reactants and goes to the top of the hill. So from 50 to 85, the EA is 35. It takes 35 kilojoules of energy to break those bonds. Those molecules have to collide with the EA equal to 35 or greater to have a successful collision. So that is determined by the nature of reactants. It's not determined by temperature or concentration. Well, what does temperature do then? Because we talk about it all the time. We're going to jump back and look at those kinetic energy distribution curves from yesterday. Very, very similar. In fact, I just cut and pasted this exactly from yesterday's notes. All temperature does is increase, increase the speed at which the reactants are moving. So if they're moving faster, they're going to hit harder, and that's going to help them meet or exceed that EA barrier, which I have highlighted there in green. So if you have a slow reaction at a low temperature, this is what it looks like. You're going to see that most of those purple reactants or pink reactants do not make it over the hill. They do not move, do not have enough Ke to collide and break those bonds. Only a few of them made it over. Only a few of them had that much energy. And that kinetic energy distribution curve showed us that. That triangle in the kinetic energy distribution curve shows us that very few molecules have sufficient Ke. So let me raise the temperature. Here's the high temperature curve. This is a faster reaction. The EA stays the same, but notice the size of that blue triangle. Okay? There are a lot more molecules that have sufficient energy and will react. So what does that look like? Well, look at the size of that blue bulb coming off that top there. Way more molecules have sufficient energy. The amount of pink reactants has gone down because they're moving faster, colliding more, colliding better, colliding with enough energy, and they're being successful. So, summarize. You're going to need to write this down. The greater the fraction of molecules that have sufficient energy will create a faster reaction. Increasing the temperature increases the fraction of molecules which have sufficient energy to form the activated complex. It does not change the EA. In big red letters down there, notice that a change in temperature does not change the potential energy diagram at all. Temperature does not affect the EA or delta H. Those are great trick questions. So let's look at a couple things here. We're going to do one or two of these um, in class tomorrow. If you want to give this a read, that's great, but we are going to spend some time on this. So here's my last little addition. We talked about collision geometry uh, a few days ago. We said if the, the two molecules have to collide each other to react, we're going to throw in one more thing. Not only do the two molecules have to collide each other to react, they have to collide, each other, collide with each other with a favorable geometry or alignment. So 
hitting head to head like this may not be the right way to do things. Maybe they want to hit side to side like this. And if they do, then they'll reach the activated complex, have a successful collision, and then they'll form the products. So it's not just about hitting hard, it's about hitting with the correct alignment. It's one minor detail, but it, it will be part of, part of this course and we'll practice this tomorrow. Um, if they hit with unfavorable alignment, it doesn't mean that the reaction will never take place. It just means that the EA will be quite a bit higher. So the dotted line here will be the unfavorable geometry and the black solid line will be the, the favorable geometry. So just to, to quickly summarize, collision theory is based off of three things. One, they have to collide to react. Two, they have to collide with sufficient energy greater to, than the EA. And three, they have to collide with the correct alignment. Okay? So to summarize the potential energy curves, that's this. The reactants are going to start. They're going to have high kinetic energy. They're moving very fast and low potential. As they approach each other, the kinetic energy goes down and the potential energy goes up. When they collide successfully, they make the activated complex. The activated complex is not moving very fast. You can argue that the kinetic energy is zero and the potential energy is 100% of it, and then they'll react, then it'll form the products. And because of those repulsive forces, they're going to push each other away, start moving very, very quickly, so they're back to having high Ke and low Pe. We will start right here tomorrow. See you then.